everybody, and welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on the network where we cover the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. Our focus right now is going to be on our first trial of the day. We're waiting for a live feed in maybe an hour or so to continue day two in the Cheyenne Harris case out of Iowa. This woman is charged with the murder and child endangerment resulting in death of her four-month-old son, Baby Sterling. This case should sound familiar to you because we covered the trial of Zachary Keene, who was the father of this baby, and he was found guilty of the same charges. Now the mother is up. However, the mother's defense here is a little bit different than the other trial. She's claiming that diminished capacity, mental illness, postpartum depression, these factors are something the jury has to consider when thinking about her guilt or not guilty uh, verdict. So we're going to talk more about this and really to try to understand what happened here, we want to get a different perspective. So joining me right now is clinical forensic psychologist, Dr. John Huber. He's back with us here on Law and Crime. Doctor, great to have you back here. Good to be back, Jesse. Thank you. Now, I want to just start from the basics of this case. Child neglect cases, and we'll get into what factors might have con uh, contributed here. But from what you've seen, how does a parent actually neglect a child, especially in this case, which is alleged a four-month-old? Well, you know, in, in this case, apparently the, the accusation is the infant was in a high chair for that whole week, essentially, and just totally neglected and left there alone. Um, there's history of drug use by both the, the mother and the father. And, and when you look at situations like that, you might be able to say, oh, well, you know, severe intoxication. You know, they're going to ignore maybe a crying baby, maybe be incapacitated cognitively. Uh, but it's pretty hard to imagine for a full five days that, uh, or even seven days, that uh, that child in a high chair is going to go completely neglected. So what, what are the mitigating factors in those types of things? Well, the, the, the loss of consciousness maybe from, from the drug use, as well as possible uh, mental illness that she's talking about, and there may be some level of uh, uh, ability for her to demonstrate that. I haven't been able to identify any any history of mental illness, but of course they may not be releasing that at this point. Okay, let's just first start with the idea of, you know, the drug use, okay, and that, you know, meth played a big part in this. In fact, it was believed right. in the first trial that meth might have been found in the umbilical cord, as disturbing as it is to say. Wow. Meth, though, this kind of drug use, isn't that a choice? I mean, if you, if you are saying, Absolutely. here's the question, if they are choosing to engage in this behavior at the detriment of a child, what leads a parent to that choice? Well, in this case, with meth, I'm sure it was uh, just the addiction to the, the, the drug itself. I mean, uh, over the years, I've seen lots of really severe cases, people not realizing how, how badly they were addicted to, to meth and uh, incapacitating them for, for weeks at a time. And it, it is possible. You know, it's not a, a pharmaceutical-grade drug. They often make this in bathtubs. You don't know everything that was in there with it. And there could be significant loss of consciousness, loss of conscious awareness. And uh, it, it, it's really disturbing to think. But you are right. It is a choice. Um, they, they can choose to go to rehab. They can choose to walk into a hospital and say, I have an addiction. Uh, they can also choose not to use the drug as well. I mean, she's charged with murder, that she intended to do this. You know, again, made a choice to neglect her child. That's what we're trying to understand. And, and, and let's say we take it out of the realm of any, you know, any kind of drugs. Let's talk about postpartum depression. Okay. We believe that will actually come up. I mean, the, the, uh, her defense team has made the idea that perhaps they will call an expert to talk about this. How does postpartum depression factor into child neglect? Well, postpartum depression would, would be a factor if it made mother so lethargic that she would, wouldn't get out of bed and, and wouldn't be able to even pr take care of herself in this kind of situation. The other thing is, you know, even with postpartum depression, I've worked with several mothers with it. Uh, it it's actually relatively common, but what happens is, you know, you've got everybody under the sun, mothers, aunts, grandmothers, friends, girlfriends going, is there anything I can do? 
And when you fall into that funk, it's it's simple enough in, in most of society to say, yeah, come come give me a hand. I can't I can't do it today. But is it always so blatant? I mean, is it always so apparent that somebody would th think, see that there's an issue? Well, when when you're talking about somebody who's mixing that with with the drugs, with the meth, then right. all of a sudden it does kind of cloud the situation because she is alert, she is able to answer the phone, she is moving around, and apparently the infant is is doing well. Maybe they hear them crying in the background and things like that. So it, it does compound the whole thing unless somebody's actually physically there. And that's where both parents, I believe, have culpability in this situation when you start looking at it because they both could have asked for help from anybody, period. You know, people look at this case and they say, well, they had a daughter, um, Sterling's sister. She was healthy. She was okay. She was two years old when she was eventually taken away from them when Sterling died. So is the idea here that, and maybe this is something, a misconception, someone can have postpartum in one pregnancy and not the other, but is it also a possibility, you tell me, could there be a favoritism over one child versus another? Because one of the things we saw in Zachary Cohen's case is he, one of his coworkers, his friends, didn't even know that he had a baby boy. Zachary never even told him that. So is that, what, how does that factor in if, in fact, there was an idea that one child was favored over another? It's absolutely possible if that, that is the case. And if you think about it, you know, everybody assumes that when a baby's born, mother just instantly falls in love with that, that child. And, and the reality of it is the mother has been carrying this child around for nine months and has never met the infant. And it takes, like any other relationship, some time to roll into it. It's one of the reasons why when you're going through pregnancy, this, this chemical in your body called oxytocin starts getting ramped up because that is part of, that's the triggering chemical for that love response that we have. And, you know, it, it's pretty complicated. But one of the things it also does is, is elasticizes her tendons and ligaments so she can dilate and actually deliver the baby. So it, it serves multiple purposes there. And it can take time for that infant and that mother to fall in love with each other, so to speak. So there could be that bias where, you know, I love my two-year-old, but, but who's this baby sitting next to me that won't leave me alone and keeps waking me up every hour and a half? Now, let me ask you this. Uh, the defense said she's not a monster. That was what they said in their opening statements. If there's any monster, there's mental health issues here. Yesterday, she broke into tears. She was, became very emotionally upset when photos of Sterling were shown to the jury uh, in that swing seat. What does that tell you? Well, that, that, that's, a, that's a normal reaction, whether somebody was experiencing some sort of psychosis and then they turn around once they're stabilized and possibly medicated, and then they see what they did while they were on their, on their uh, uh, break, their psychotic break or their mental health break. And uh, that, that's a very common response because they are not the same person when they're in that episode. The same thing with people who are with addictions. You know, if you're on, if you're on alcohol or heroin or crystal meth, and then you see afterwards the, the results of your neglect of that behavior, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're tormented, you're destroyed. They're not saying that this woman is a, a sociopath, antisocial personality disorder. They're saying that this woman, you know, has either mental health problems or there was that drug component. And, you know, we can look at it and compare it to something everybody's more familiar with, and that's like drinking and driving or death. You know, when you in an accident you kill somebody, we still consider you culpable for drinking and for that death because you did choose to do that, and it could be looked at that way during this situation. I think she said at one point she didn't want to take the postpartum depression medicine, maybe, and maybe I was wrong, maybe she did have it also after the, the first child because she said it made her sick. Is that, a, is that truthful? I mean, is that, is that, does this medicine to fight this, can it create an adverse reaction? Absolutely. And the thing is, though, there's several, you know, over 100 different medications they could have utilized. If she was being made sick by that, it was probably because of a combination of the, the illegal drugs she was using and or she should have gone back to her doctor and said, hey, you know, this medicine makes me sick, I, I need either something else or I need to not take it. And that's one of the things that, you know, the doctors have probably already discussed with her. Let us know how you're reacting to this. It's standard of care in, you know, my hospitals that I work with, all the way to the private practitioners that send their patients to me.
you know, we, we, we we can't just look at one parent and not the other. We're covering, we covered the trials of both of them, and Zachary Cohen was found guilty. One of the things that I remember from that trial is that he said he put all the responsibility, or most of the responsibility, of taking care of the child in Cheyenne's hands, and the idea that he was working. And he, he actually got um, nauseous at the idea of having to clean up after the baby. So this separation between the, the father and the mother, is that something you've seen before? You know, I, I, I work with lots of couples and lots of families, and most of them have their ideals and, and preconceived ideas. He's already had a child. Uh, I think this is, at best, ludicrous. Now, I wasn't there, and I haven't assessed him or anything else. I think it's kind of a weak argument, at, at best, as because we, we have very many people out there who have these staunch purely masculine beliefs that, oh, that's, that's not for men. And, but the minute their baby's born, what are they doing? They're, they're bent over the baby changing diapers and, and bathing the baby and taking care of it. It's one of those things that happens. So I, th I think it's, it's uh, totally uh, a, a farcical to think that he somehow uh, had no responsible for the, for responsibility for that. He should have been involved in it, even if all he did was pick up the phone and called called 911 and said, hey, we can't take care of my child. Help me. You know, and believe it or not, there's actually in most police departments and emergency service uh, lines, 311, 511, yeah. 911, where help is available for this kind of stuff because we realize there's no rule book for this and there's no instruction manual for and parents. This, and the scary thing to think about is that this baby, baby Sterling, just never had a chance. Dr. John Absolutely. Huber, thank you so much for coming on. We can't wait to have you back. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have a lot more to talk about from the first day in the Cheyenne Harris case. We'll be right back.